always say don't have nightmares. Most people have hearts of gold. Well, Crime Watch viewers do. Remember the elderly woman in Cardiff and her visit from two conmen posing as roofers? I knew something had happened. These princesses were in the bedroom. Why should they want to go across the bedroom? They had found and taken her life savings of £16,000. Unprompted by us, hundreds of people have offered cash, including builders determined to say not all builders are cowboys. A bank account's been set up and the woman, who doesn't want to be named, says she is overwhelmed by so much kindness. Incidentally, though, we are still looking for the villain of the piece. Thanks also for your help on two of the most high-profile cases of recent months. First, on the Sarah Payne inquiry. As you probably heard in the news, a man's now been charged. And thanks from the Met after our appeal on Damilola Taylor, which helped to gain more information from a key witness. Some crimes are simply unfathomable. However hard you think about it, it is impossible to imagine how someone could want to be so cruel to another human being. A week ago, near the road to Queen's Park Rangers football ground in West London, a boy found what seemed to be a torch. He picked it up, he tried to turn it on, and it exploded. Stephen Mennery lost his left hand, his left eye, and received terrible wounds to his chest and body. He'd already lost the sight of one eye through cancer as a baby, so now he's blind. The bomb has also seriously damaged his hearing. Now, no one can possibly have anything against Stephen. He's only 14, he's never done anyone any harm. He's in no position to talk, but his mum, who's staying at the hospital bedside with him, has made this appeal to Crime Watch. They've left my son with no sight, he's blind. They left him with no hands. It's not just the physical scars, his stomach is worse than I expected, actually. And the pain he's going through, especially through that. It's what is just everything. And you can only hear out of one ear. What do you say? I mean, where do you stop? Where does it go on? Where does this nightmare stop? I don't know. He loved the TAs. He loves the cadets. He loves going to the weekends. He loves all the excitement. I think them boots should be worn out with a polish and every polish he's tried. And he just got his two star, which he was very proud of. And we didn't even have time to sew it on. I'm basically at the moment, I'm on switch off, I have to be, because if I get too much, then I'll break up and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be strong for him. As long as he doesn't know I cry, he's OK. I probably shall. Sure. He'll be all right. He told his mum, how will I be able to use a guide dog? I've only got one hand, and the whole thing is so tragic. Just take us through what happened. He found this in the bushes outside the, the TA centre as he was going in. T take us through what happened. Yes, he was at the rear of the, uh, the TA centre, uh, had uh, exited through a fire escape, found this torch, or saw it under a bush, uh, which adjoins the pavement, uh, picked it up, and as we all would, turned it on. Nothing happened. Uh, he turned it off, and he now tells us, and he's able to tell us a little more each day, uh, that he unscrewed it. Here, at the bottom. Yes. And inside saw a small square battery which only had one of the connectors connected. Tragically, he connected both, screwed it up again, and as he re-entered the TA center, uh, switched the device on uh, with the horrendous result that we now know. Had it been left in a position where it shouldn't have exploded? In other words, was it left and designed to be harmless or was it left designed to kill? No, this is, this is designed to kill. Uh, no one would make a device like this. It, it is to maim and it's to seriously injure and to kill. And the motive, in your view? I, I cannot ignore that this was a TA centre, uh, that it has strong connections with the parachute regiment, um, and that high explosive was used. Uh, that said, it, whilst you might lead to terrorism, it, is, it could well be the lone bomber. There has been no claim of responsibility. Um, <laughs> The high explosive, we are still to ascertain what type of explosive it was. Uh, contrary to some reports that we know it's Semtex, that is by no means certain. This could be the lone bomber. So it could be somebody that a viewer knows has an interest in making things explode? Yes. Has had a torch like this? 
there could be somebody watching now who thinks, I think I know who might have been involved with that. That's exactly the case. It, it's someone perhaps uh, with an obsession with explosives, uh, known to experiment with explosives, uh, and works on such things as, as torches and other perhaps innocent articles. Uh, and what we are determined to do is, one, prevent this happening again, um, and we would call for anyone to talk to us on the confidential hotline that we have regarding anyone they suspect, or indeed anyone they saw in South Africa Road this time, or last Wednesday. Now that's important, there's a sort of an AstroTurf football ground opposite, a few people would have been playing on that. Anybody who was there, what, 7pm-ish, sometime like that last, last Wednesday? Yes, I would put a time from about three o'clock in the afternoon uh, until quarter to seven in the evening. Okay, so this. anyone in South Africa Avenue acting suspiciously, hanging around, uh, please come forward and tell us. OK, if there's any way that you can help, anywhere at all, please, just give us a call. It's a free call number here, 0500 600 600, or you can call the instant room itself. That's also a free phone number, 0800 789 321. Coming up in tonight's programme, two men leap over an off-licence counter and threaten the shop assistant. I was so scared, didn't know what they were going to do and just let them do anything they wanted. The salesman stranded on the M62 in the most surprising car theft we have ever covered. A jewellery heist in London's Hatton Garden. And we'll tell you why we're looking for these four. In Caversham, near Reading in Berkshire, someone is living with a terrible secret. Four years ago, Katie Salvini lived in this street with her two children. She takes up the story of what happened on a day out with her little girl, Emily. We visited one of these um, major stores and we did a girly shop. It was our first ever mother-daughter girly shop. I let her loose on all these um, girls' clothes. She was such a tall, slender girl wearing these great sort of box dresses that were far too big and wide. We had a lovely time. Got back by eight. Um, she got ready for bed and went to sleep. Went in to check on Zach. I changed his nappy and settled him down with me that night in my bed. And we both fell asleep about 12. Whatever time it was, um, Zach woke up crying, which is very, very unlike him, which woke me up. I opened the door and um, I can remember a whoosh. I think my nighty went, I'm not sure. But um, fire, um, white, yellow fire, up to the ceiling. It wasn't even flames, it was like a wall. And it just whooshed into the room. Zach was screaming, he had to be got out. I opened the window and lowered him, it was quite a way actually, onto this ledge. I can remember him looking up at me in his nappy. Um, but then, of course, my thoughts just went to him. We were asleep and uh, my son came into her bedroom and told us there was a fire. So when I looked out, I saw a woman and a child trapped on a ledge across the street. The house was glowing behind them. I immediately went across the road and I shouted to, to pass me the child down. And the slates was all falling off the roof. She passed the child down with, with its hands and I was able to hold it and catch it and just told her to claim down. All that was ever going through my head was Emily. Emily, I've got to get Emily out. Emily. 
Emily was found upstairs and was rushed to hospital. But Zach and Katie were also badly burned and followed on in a second ambulance. The only thing I can remember is asking about Emily and the answer I always got is she's in safe hands. The children's grandfather got to the hospital soon after. I said to him, you know, go and find Em, please. And he came back and it's my last memory, I think, for about four weeks. Um, he came here, stroking my hair and um, crying. And he just said that Emily had died. I mean, the fundamental issue is that there was a little girl who got put to bed and who died there. It's hard to imagine how someone could live with themselves after doing something like that. And, and for Katie, the mother, obviously, it's just a harrowing ordeal. And she went back in, didn't she? She tried to, her best to save Emily. Yeah, it was just not possible to, to save Emily. The, the fire was raging up the stairs, the bedrooms were alight. She did her best, but there was no way she could have rescued her daughter. And she was very badly burnt herself, wasn't she? Indeed. It was a miracle that she survived the, the effects of the flames. Now, it's been four years since this horrific crime. Why do we think people might come forward now? Relationships and their dynamics have changed in that time. Uh, people who felt that they couldn't tell us something at, at, at the time of the offence, when they were interviewed perhaps, can now come forward. Uh, perhaps they're not in, in the same sort of relationship as they were earlier. I'm sure somebody locally has the answer to the motive and why this, why this crime took place. We need to know that. We need somebody with courage who knows what happened to come forward and tell us why she was killed in her own bed in her own home. And what do you know about the person who did this? I believe the person's local. The, uh, the whole thing was well prepared. It was a callous crime committed at a time when, when people are going to be in bed. The phones are deliberately cut at locations to prevent people being able to alert the emergency services. A callous, awful crime. Do you think it was a man or a woman? Can you know? Uh, I would say it's likely to be a man because of the height of which the, uh, the, the wires were cut on the telephone lines. However, it, it could be a woman. And there were previous incidents to this as well, weren't Indeed. There? In, in the weeks leading up to, the, to this uh, awful attack, there were a number of issues of damage. The telephone wires to the home address were cut. Um, Katie's father's car tyres were slashed while they were parked outside the house. Um, I believe the things that were very strongly connected. It was a pattern of behaviour which ended up in this appalling arson attack. Well, there's uh, a reward on this case, a £10,000 reward. You may be perhaps an ex-girlfriend uh, of the person who did this, didn't feel you could come forward then, you can come forward now. In all conscience, if you know anything, you must call us. Call here in the studio on 0500 600 600 or the instant room on 01189 181 752. Your calls really do help to solve crime. Back in the 1980s, Crime Watch covered several rapes and murders, which seemed to be unconnected. But here at the Crime Watch studios, detectives who'd gathered for the appeals realised they were linked. Thirteen years ago, John Duffy was convicted of three murders and a string of sex offences. And on the 2nd of February, the law finally caught up with John Duffy's accomplice, David Mulcahy. He's now serving three life sentences. And another conviction, Peter Kroll is now serving nine years for armed robberies after a police officer watching Crime Watch back in May called in and identified him. I don't really need to tell you much about this next crime. Just have a listen, take a look and make up your own minds. I was working on my local off licence and um, I was on the phone to my friend. The next thing I knew, two men charged into the shop. <laughs> I was so scared, didn't know what they were going to do, and just let them do anything they wanted. I was petrified, shaking, and it just felt like a dream. I didn't know what was happening. All I remember seeing was this silver gun pointed in front of my head. When they'd left, I didn't know what to do. I was panicking. I checked the phone to see if my friend was still there because I just needed someone to tell. I thought they could be outside. 
I, I didn't know where they were. She was brave enough to come and tell us her story, and now it's your turn. If you've any idea who these two are, don't let anyone else suffer like this. And who are these two who were seen in the shop before the attack? They could be vital witnesses. Ring 01784 446647. And all of the incident room numbers are on CFAX page 621. There are only 34 cars like this in Britain. Steel blue, automatic, 530 diesel BMWs. In fact, there may now only be 33 because one of them has gone missing. So, if you see one of these, then let the police know so that it can be checked out. Why? We'll take a look at how it was acquired. Um, I don't know if the advert mentioned this, but the 530 diesel we have is a steel blue. I know I'm biased, but it's a really smart car. OK, as you wish, that's fine. But as I say, I've had other customers interested in the car. OK, I look forward to meeting your son-in-law tomorrow at half two. OK, take care. Hi. Hi, yeah, I'm here for a test drive. Yeah, OK, just want to take a seat in the waiting area. I'll be with you Thank know you. shortly, OK? Hello. I'm Victor. All right, good hey, to see you. Pleased to meet you. Pleased yeah. to meet you. Did you have a good journey? Yeah, not too bad. Bit long though. Bit tired now. Okay, okay. I had a word with your father-in-law yesterday. It's the uh, steel blue 530 ID. Yeah, that's the one. Okay, yeah, that's nice car. It's pretty nice, isn't it? So we up to at the moment. Oh, a bit of this, bit of that. Mm -hmm. I've just finished university. You know, that was a bit of a laugh. Hi. Oh, yeah. You know what it's like: study hard, play hard. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, I like this. It's not yeah. bad. The engine's a 3 litre diesel at 0 to 60 in 7.9 seconds. I've been looking at this model for a while and uh, now it's a high performance car. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, although it is a diesel, it is in actual fact one of the fastest production diesels in the world. Yeah, yeah. I'll pull in over here, you can have a drive if you like. All right, great. Yeah, I mean, that bought my brother a car, but he smashed it on the motorway. It was an M3. My dad's a bit angry with him. Sure. Well, I'm quite relieved, as you can imagine. Mm. Mm. Oh, my phone's vibrating. It'll be my dad ringing me. Oh, well, don't worry. I've, I've actually got to talk to him there. Just pull over here. Um, OK, yeah. vehicle and give me your phone give me your phone at that split second everything changed from a normal test drive into a horrendous nightmare I couldn't believe that that was actually happening and almost at the same time I'm thinking I'm going to be very seriously injured Wednesday, six weeks ago, 2.30 in the afternoon, where the M62 is joined by the M6. Did you see any of this? It was a, a smart appearance, um, nothing to ring any alarm bells, but one thing I did notice was he wore um, dark blue trousers with very, very tan kicker-type boots. Although this isn't... Uh, in any way unusual to me, although he was very smart to me, it just didn't match uh, his clothing. He also had woolen gloves and a woolen scarf, uh, both dark blue. Um, on the day it was cold anyway, but he kept those on even in the showroom. Uh, one thing I did notice was he had two shaved lines in the left eyebrow. At that point, I was very calm. Surprisingly calm. I just picked up the phone, told them I'd just been robbed at uh, gunpoint and had a car taken. And it was only the reaction on the other end of the phone when someone mentioned robbery that that's when I uh, lost it, uh, broke down completely. Amazing way to steal a car, isn't it? So have a good look at this missing one. Or this is an identical one the grey leather interior, the steel blue paintwork, the star spoke wheels. And when it was stolen, it had that model designation 530D on the boot. Um, it's uh, an unusual crime, as I say. It's forced a, a pretty big change in security at garages. There is a substantial reward. So ring us here or call the instant room on 01244 613 
834. Alsatians, Dobermans and Rottweilers are the normal type of pets you expect to see as guard dogs. We'll meet an unlikely canine hero in Godmanchester, Cambridge. A 13-year-old girl was out for a walk three months ago. As she was going along St Anne's Lane, a man approached her from nowhere, pushed her to one side and indecently assaulted her. As you can imagine, she was absolutely terrified. What he hadn't accounted for was that such a harmless-looking dog could give such a nasty nip. The man was scared off, much to the girl and her mother's relief. She has an extremely soft spot for the dog. And he's a big old softy. He, he really is. Um, yeah, he was protecting her. He, he knew something wasn't right. If he hadn't have been there, then I think it, it could have been a lot worse. The girl gave a very clear description of her attacker. He's about 40, medium height, but quite broad. He had dark, gelled hair and a fat, triangular nose. He was pasty looking and had bitten fingernails. Well, there may not be a dog around next time to help, so please, if you know he is, who he is, call us here, 0500 600 600, or you can call the Incident Room direct on 01480 415 800. Just been looking at some of the calls that have been coming in about that bomb that was concealed in a torch uh, that was uh, left by a TA centre in White City in West London, which blew off the left hand and blinded the 14-year-old Stephen Menery. We've had huge numbers of people, I haven't been able to collate how many yet, but certainly dozens who've been offering money for the family. We've had a lot of people saying the torch is a military issue torch, not a civilian one. We know that, we think we know there are a variety of places where it can come from. We're still trying to find witnesses in South Africa Road who saw it being put there. We have, we think, got one significant witness. Later, we'll be reopening a case we covered 11 years ago. A man found stabbed 40 times after his car was hijacked in a busy shopping street. His brother will be here in the studio. And any idea who this is? He could be responsible for the rape of a man in Kent. First, Hatton Garden, London, home of the jewellery trade. A Tuesday in January, soon after the New Year. I was at my desk working. My daughter was just at the back of the shop. Um, my son was in the back office. Three men, all black, one noticeably taller than the others, charged into the shop, spraying CS gas. There was an almighty crash, which sounded like a shotgun going off. And I ran to the shop to find my daughter just huddled up on the back seat of the shop. And then all of a sudden, Somebody pulled a gun at me. Yes! The thing that frightened me the most was they were attacking my children. To hell with the jewellery. They made off in a stolen Fiat Punto which they abandoned in High Hoban. The day before the robbery, it might have been the same three men that showed great interest in the shop. They turned up like lunchtime asking questions about some bigger pieces in the window. Hi guys, how can I help you? They just didn't look right. The whole appearance, the way they were asking too many questions and looking around all the time as we're talking to them. And then about two hours later, they came back again looking in the window, looking in the shop. The taller man seemed about six foot, light skinned, thin, with close cropped hair. The two shorter men turned up again at quarter past five, and as a precaution, the shop owner removed his most expensive gems from the display. Innocent window shoppers, or was this the gang? Amongst other pieces, the robbers got away with a large amount of high-quality diamond jewellery, including this unique diamond bracelet and this pair of diamond and emerald earrings. Have you seen them? Call us here in the studio, 0500 600 600, or call Crime Stoppers anonymously if you want, on 0800 555 1, and there is a reward. And now some characters enjoying themselves with other people's money. First, have a look at this man. He's very recognisable because of his distinctive hairstyle. He's run up huge bills using stolen credit cards. And you recognise this couple. We'd like to talk to them about bunches of roses and a night in a Brighton hotel. Sounds romantic, but it was all paid for with a stolen credit card. 
He may know nothing about it, but they obviously know each other. Call on both these cases, 0500 600 600. We also need to find these next four faces. We know their names, but not where they are. The first two are particularly dangerous. James Anderson is wanted in connection with a murder and could be armed. Jason Scott we want to speak to regarding armed robberies and an attempted murder. And next, we're looking for these two, suspected of drugs offences. Stephen Johnson from Merseyside and Raymond Parfit from Nottingham. Ring us here, 0500 600 600. Crime figures are generally going down, but the latest statistics show a rise in street robberies. A lot of those are, of course, kids bullying other youngsters, but they're all dangerous. And here's one involving adults that turn to murder. It happened in the centre of Birmingham in October. The victim was Kelly Lorakman, who was locally well known. With my dad, you never get bored. He's got lots of things to say to you. He's always talking, talking, talking. He used to love cooking, and he did come round home and start cooking, but my mum, she didn't used to like eating what my dad used to cook. In fact, Mr Rahman used to own four restaurants, and though he'd more or less retired, he regularly went round to colleagues. I know him from the last 15 years. Uh, he was a restaurant owner like me, a good friend, close friend. Come out uh, to chill out, I think with friends, and he chat till four or five in the morning, talk, talk about, you know, his personal life. Late that Saturday night, in fact now 4.30 Sunday morning, he went to get his car. He said, no, it's already late, I'm going home. At about the same time, a taxi dropped two men in Bristol Street. The driver is an important witness. Back in October, did you have a silver Toyota Carina? I could see two men coming running towards my car. I didn't really like the look of them. They were acting a bit strange. All right, boss. You're free, mate. No, mate, I'm booked. Yeah, no, that's all right, mate. Come on. L lad, I'm booked. Take us to the massage parlour, mate. There's nothing open at this time of the night, and I'm booked anyway. Oh, mate, they're open all night in Manchester. Come on, you're not trying to tell me... That These men, they made me feel very nervous. I mean, I didn't like the look of them at all. Zero, zero, zero Bristol Street. The driver gave a distress code and other cabs quickly converged on Bristol Street to help him out. Realising that the cab simply wasn't going to take them, the two men eventually gave up, but they kept on asking for a massage parlour and wanted someone who would take them there. One of the other drivers, he knew there was a massage parlour open down the road, so he just pointed him towards that massage parlour and that was the last time we've seen him. Just beyond these cameras, Mr. Rahman was kicked and punched, and his money was taken. Uh. 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 Portion! 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 He was saying that he got a pain in his stomach, in his sides. I was going to get a little bit of he said, two white people attacked me and took my money. It was strange. We speak Bengali, and he was saying one of them used a Pakistani or Indian word, which is a rude swearing word. Mr. Rahman was taken to hospital, while down the road another robbery was happening. The victim had a Scottish accent. A man who helped him was an Asian in his 30s. They're both important witnesses, and we guarantee they'll be treated with the greatest discretion. They ran off, hailed another cab, and went to a snooker hall where they were refused admission and caused some damage. They told one taxi driver they came from Manchester, but told another it was Liverpool and implied that they were down in Birmingham for a football match between Sunderland and Aston Villa. Khalil Rahman never came out of hospital. The kicking had ruptured internal organs, and five weeks later, he died.
it's just a big shock for all of us. Just for £90, they just went and murdered my dad. My brother and sister, they're only young. I mean, the youngest one is four years old. She doesn't know what, you know, she doesn't have, she hasn't much, she hasn't had time with my dad much. She doesn't know what dying is. And when you talk about my dad, he's gone. She's saying, no, oh, he'll come one day. Graham, I call this a robbery. I wonder if that was the real motive, because Kylo was actually kicked, as it happens, kicked to death after they'd stolen the money. That's right, we are treating it as a racist attack because, in part of exactly what you've just said, but also because of the uh, particularly insulting swear word that the attackers used. And in the second attack you know about, which happened, we're not sure if it happened, it started outside the massage parlour, maybe those two guys were just chased into the massage parlour. Uh, again, there seems to be racial abuse in that one. That's right, we know that um, from a witness that we believe uh, some sort of insult was uh, shouted at the Asian man, accompanying the Scottish man who eventually got beaten up. Now, it's absolutely critical those two come forward. They're really important witnesses, those who were chased into the massage parlour. Absolutely. Well, it's the chap with the Scottish accent, who actually was a white guy they caught up with, who actually got the kicking. That's right, yes. Now, it looks like these two could have been away day people, gone to, to Birmingham, you know, to have a night out. Um, massage parlour, kick a few heads in and all the rest of it. How are you going to trace them through Crime Watch? What's your best hope? Obviously, we're hoping that um, they've had a, a wild night out in Birmingham, they've gone back to wherever they originate from, and they've perhaps boasted to friends about the time that they've had, the fact that they've attacked a couple of people, visited massage parlours and, you know, from their perspective, had a, a really good night out. This is back in uh, October, Saturday night, 21st of October. Supposing they've seen themselves on the CCTV, they, they, they know they're going to get apprehended, uh, and they come forward and say, look, we didn't intend to kill anybody. What happens then? Well, obviously, I'm conducting a murder investigation. If they do come forward and convince me that murder wasn't what they intended, that would be borne in mind when considering appropriate charges. But obviously the longer it takes for them to come forward, the more suspicious I become about what their intentions actually were. Well, bring us here in the studio. Free call. 0500 600 600. If it's you, if you know who it is, if you've heard anything. Or you can call the instant room that's in Birmingham, 0121 200 2552. And there's a Bengali speaker there if you're a witness to any of this. And if you want to speak uh, confidentially on this or any other crime, you can call Victim Support Line, and the number there is 0845 30 30 900. And let me update you on that terrible case in Reading where Katie Salvini and her two small children were asleep in their beds when someone poured petrol through the letterbox and set the house alight. I opened the window and lowered him, it was quite a way actually, onto this ledge. I can remember him looking up at me in his nappy. Um, but then, of course, my thoughts just went to him. And Emily died in that fire. Now, we haven't had as many calls as I would like, to be frank. We've had two names mentioned. We need much more than that. You must call in if you know anything, anything at all, if you've heard anyone talking about that. I've got to tell you, someone has rung in calling himself a hardened criminal and he says he's so disgusted he thinks the person responsible should hand themselves in. So there you are, even the criminal fraternity are disgusted by this. If you know anything, please call us here. Coming up, Albert Patrick, the detective brought out of retirement to solve a case that's 11 years old. Stalking is a frightening crime and imagine being stalked for 18 years. It's a horrifying thought and one woman has suffered just that. It started when she was a student. I've spent almost the majority of my life being hunted by this person who is completely relentless in their pursuit of me. This man has slept in my front garden and he has visited where I work as well. Um, I have to be escorted by security. He clearly will put himself at risk of capture in order to get near to me. He's made hundreds of phone calls to places where I live and work. And he sent me dozens and dozens of letters. It's like being haunted as well as being hunted. It feels like an invisible presence that's constantly after you. Recently, things have got much, much worse. And 
the letters now talk about killing me. They also talk about killing members of my family. And here's some examples of these letters, and believe you me, they are dreadful. Now, uh, I've got one here which talks about the small print on the contract to kill you. That is frightening. Now, we're confident that Ben Bono can help. He's 54, he may be sleeping rough, and he often wears a top hat. This is what he could look like clean-shaven, and we need to find him. Call the instant room on 020 8733 3918. Or here in the studio on 0500 600 600. Well, we obviously desperately need to catch him, as we do this man. He's a flasher and regularly patrols the London underground, exposing himself to women. He was enjoying the fact that I was so shocked. He, he really... Um, I was just so shocked I looked straight down and didn't look up again. I realised that he was actually um, masturbating. I, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. There are now 16 reported cases, but there could be many more. He doesn't care what time it is, and the offences range from midday to midnight. He travels on various different tubes, including the Metropolitan, Bakerloo, Piccadilly and District lines. It makes me very angry that he, he was um, getting the pleasure out of in, intimidating me, because by the time I'd reached the concourse at Waterloo, I was just livid that he had put me in that position and made me feel so helpless. And who's this man seen here on CCTV at various different stations? He does fit the description of the flasher, but he could be an innocent passerby. Let us know. One of the victims got a very clear view of his face and was able to put together this e-fit. Do you recognise him? If so, you could prevent further incidents. Please call us here in the studio on 0500 600 600. And you can, of course, email us here on cwuk at bbc.co.uk. Deal, a seaside town in Kent. It's a place that's popular with tourists. On a Sunday night a month ago, a local resident had gone down to the seafront. I have a very set routine. I take a couple of hours out every Sunday evening between about 8 and 10 and listen to the radio in the car park by the seafront. On that particular Sunday, there were some cyclists, dog walkers, um, and people perhaps just walking from one place to another, but battling against the cold, a proper winter's night. I've been going to this area now for uh, over two years, and the only people have, who I've met there have always been pleasant and kind. Excuse me, mate. Can you help me find my dog? I've lost him in the surf. Please, mate, I'm really worried. I can't find him. Please, mate. He went running on ahead of me towards the surf. It was quite low tide, so it was a long way down to the sea. Um, I'm not the fittest person in the world, so I jogged relatively half-heartedly down towards the sea. Once I got to the water's edge, he was calling for the dog and then turned to run towards me. I was very, very scared. He tied him up with strips of his jacket. The man was slashed with a knife and raped. His attacker was about five foot ten, slim, muscular, and had shaved off his pubic hair. He walked away very slowly, very calmly, very controlled. There was never any fear with this man. 
he was very aware of what he was doing at every single stage, every single part of it. There were several people in the area by Warmer Castle deal on Sunday four weeks ago who owned this white Nissan parked here. Who else saw anything suspicious? Four days earlier, a jogger noticed a man who was hanging round the public toilets. Like the rapist, he was in his 20s, average height, slim and muscular. My wife has been a, a, a brick, a real rock, a, a wonderful support for me, however hard it must be. She is a, a victim in this as well. I come from a very close and loving family, and they find this very hard to contend with, that this could have happened. And it'll take a long time, yeah, it'll take a long time. That was a horrifying ordeal for that man. Let's catch the rapist before he attacks someone else. 0500 600 600 or 01303 289 141. Remember the girl attacked in Stanwell Moor? There's a phone card. Thank you, thank God we don't sell phone cards. What did you say? Take everything, please. Where's your phone? I was really scared. I was petrified, shaking, and it just felt like a dream. I didn't know what was happening. All I remember seeing was this silver gun pointed in front of my head. I have had two names suggested and one in the area, so I'm hopeful, but this was a terrifying experience for a young student simply doing part-time work to earn some money and then find herself confronted by two violent robbers. Your help in tracking them down is vital. More feedback on this case on Crime Watch Daily tomorrow at 10 a.m. Unfortunately, we've had very call, little calls. In fact, I don't think there's been any at all coming in on the brave dog who protected that young girl from being seriously attacked in Godmanchester. Sir John Stevens, the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, has ordered a huge review of unsolved murders in the capital. He's brought detectives out of retirement. They've applied new scientific techniques and they reckon some of the crimes can now be cracked. One of them we featured back in 1990. Sarinda Gill was a flamboyant character from Southall in West yeah. London, an insurance yeah, broker fine. who did much of his business by phone. No at all. But 11 years ago, when driving here down South Road, Sarinda seems to have been hijacked. Uh, you can come see us tomorrow. The counter's not in today. Disconnect. Disconnect. Mr. Gill? Mr. Mr. Gill? Soon afterwards, Surrender's car was seen driving onto Beaver's open space in Green Lane, Hounslow. And the following morning, his body was found inside. He'd been stabbed 39 times through the chest and neck. Well, this is Harpole Gill, who's Surrender's brother, along with Albert Patrick, the detective who's now reviewing the case. Harpole, after 10 years, are you, are you pleased that they're now reviewing it? Yeah, I'm pleased that the police haven't given up hope, and I hope the public too will not give up hope in finding my brother's killers. This was a particularly brutal crime. I mean, what have you got in terms of motive? Why do you think it happened? It's uh, I must keep an open mind. It's got three or four motives that could be could be responsible for for Surinder's murder, uh, and obviously through this program, we'd like to appeal to whoever knows to give us a ring. Take us through what those possibilities are. Yes, one. He, he did uh, have several girlfriends, and it could be revenge because of his, his womanising, for want of a better word. That would account for a sort of the, the real ferocity of the yes, attack. Yes, certainly. He, he may have owed money. He was in smart, some financial difficulty, so that's a motive. And there's also intelligence uh, on the file that suggests that he was involved in drugs, although there's no hard evidence to suggest that that is a real motive. And he had no criminal uh, background. No, no, the, the, he, he was a lovely guy. But obviously anybody who knows anything about that, you badly need to hear from uh, yes. at all. You did, I know... Um, after the, the, the program, uh, you've got somebody saying there was a white vehicle that was involved, that was in, in tandem with his own when he That's drove right. off. A white vehicle, perhaps a Katrina a box type, was seen in South Road with a man with a crash helmet, and then much later, in the, well, about an hour in Salisbury Road, near the crime scene, near the murder scene, a car in tandem with uh, Surinder's car, uh, veering through the back streets of it. You, had a, you, you found an EFIT from yes. 10 years ago, which was, was never re released at the time. It's a very peculiar looking EFIT. Yes, uh, it is. It's the lady who drew the it's artist's impression. It's an artist's artist impression. Yes, it's it? an artist impression. It, 11 years ago, she described it as male with blonde hair, and he was laughing in the front passenger seat. And we believe, I believe, Surinder was driving the car at the time. 
uh, and, and then she said to me last week that it could have been female. So again, that person, whoever that is, who knows who he is or she is, please ring. Asian and white together. Yes. You got a letter three months after Crime Watch. That's right. Typewritten letter, very important. It mentioned the Holy Smoke Gang, it mentioned all sorts of other things. Whoever wrote that letter obviously wanted to help then. Yes, and I need him to pick up the phone, he or she, to talk to me because so much intelligence in there. I do need to talk to them anonymously if needs be. Well, supposing somebody says, look, this is all ten years ago, there's no point in me ringing in now, dredging it all up again. Well, even after 10 years, the pain is still there. I mean, I just want to take this opportunity to appeal to anyone who has any information, even after 10 years, to just come forward and share this information and help ease some of the pain. Well, call us if you know anything, 0500 600 600, or the incident room, 020 7321 7352. And can you tell me who this is? He could be responsible for up to 13 armed robberies, all in Worthing in Sussex since Christmas. Invariably, he wears this beige jacket with a hood and produces a shotgun from a white carrier bag. We're going to catch him and with your help even quicker. Call the instant room on 0845 60 70 treble 9. And now another story about people walking into shops and taking what is not theirs. Have a look at this man in a jeweller's in Warwick. He's pretending to be browsing and is then joined by two others who distract the shopkeeper while he scoops up the rings. Call us 0500 600 600. Three sexual assaults on the Isle of Wight towards the end of last year. Each time the women were leaving the same nightclub in Carisbrook on the edge of Newport. Each time they managed to fight the attacker off. Not surprisingly, the police are worried about what he might do next. I went to Woody's nightclub and um, it was just basically an average night. I went to um, Turquoise and my friend got something to eat and then I carried on walking off up the road. I was actually texting someone on my phone. I was about a quarter of the way into the lane and I could hear someone running behind me. So stupidly enough, I just moved to the side so they could get past me, but it was then that they grabbed me. I think I felt too safe, um, and I do admit that because nothing has ever happened to me like this before. We left the nightclub, Cheers, good night. Have a night. Thanks. Cheers, thanks. and we went to the kebab house to get something to eat. And um, my friend actually said to me that I was stupid to walk home, and did I want him? to walk me home, but I just laughed it off. It wasn't until I was about halfway home that I noticed that someone was following me. He had dark features, like dark eyebrows, dark eyes, um, quite a prominent square jaw, early 20s. He just caught up really fast. I could see a shadow growing next to me because the lights were behind us, and then just grabbed me from behind. Of course, all my family came over and all my friends. And so it's just one person after another having to give me hugs. And I don't know, every time somebody hugged me, it made me more upset and I just felt like I was crying for days. <laughs> I come home from work one day and I was just um, watching TV. Saw on the news that it happened again. It was about half one when we left Woody's and we walked up to Turquoise and my sister and her friends were going into Turquoise and I said I was going home. And then I went down left along Caesars Road and that's when I noticed a bloke. He had a white, a creamy scarf and it was just like over the nose. I had to take my inhaler because I was wheezing, because I was getting scared. Then he passed me, so I thought, oh, that's all right, it'll be all right. So when it first happened, it was just like a nightmare in my mind, sort of thing. And that's how I'd like to keep it, really. It's like a bad nightmare. I just really couldn't believe it was happening to me. I was just so scared. 
I just look at people in the street and I think, you know, I could walk past him and, and not know. We're looking for a man who goes out dressed in black and may own a plain white scarf. He could be local or taking the boat over specifically to carry out these attacks. He's got to be stopped. 0500 600 600 or 01983 534. Next month on Crime Watch, the net is closing in on a murder in a restaurant that happened in 1998. When I went downstairs, I started calling her name Choti, Choti, in a very frantic manner. Then I went to the storeroom and I found the body. Just to uh, bring up to date with some of the calls we've had so far, still on that torch bomb in West London, we've got that one potential witness. It still hasn't been checked out, so I can't ground that and tell you just how significant it is, but certainly the investigating officer says that uh, he thinks it could be quite important. Uh, on the arson attack in which the, the little girl died, uh, still there's two names, uh, and again, if there's anything more that we can tell you about that, we'll do so shortly in Cromwich Update at five past eleven. On the BMW, five names have come in for that. Five names and all sorts of sightings of that uh, that stolen BMW possibility all being looked at uh, at the moment. Uh, there's a name come in too on the Hatton Garden robbery. That was the, the, the jewel thieves, the three of them. I'm not sure which of the three that was. As I say, Cromwich Update is at five past eleven. Do join us then. And uh, whatever happens, don't have nightmares. Do please sleep well. Good night. Good night.